So uh, I feel like everybody talks about mediation, moderation, mediation, moderation. It really like obscures the fact that they are very separate hypotheses. Right? If you're predicting moderation as your hypothesis, or your hypothesis, your hypothesis, um, you are thinking about changes in relationships. So how you're kind of looking at how much correlations kind of um, are overlapping, whereas moderation is totally about interactions. I think people get them confused because they, they rhyme, they like, they're used so much together, but moderation is ANOVA on continuous variables. Right? And technically, ANOVA is moderation on categorical variables, but you know, most people learn ANOVA first. So it's really a way to test um, interactions on continuous variables. You can do this completely in regression and do categorical variables too, but at that point it becomes ANOVA. Right? So it's really all about interactions. <coughs> And so a similar question, silly example. So out of the number of PhD years, you're out of your PhD. So I'm like about to cross that early career researcher line and become the old out of my PhD person. So it's like thinking, okay, the number of years out of your PhD and the number of statistics courses that you had predicting your regression skill. So uh, if we are uh, early career researchers, and we had a lot of statistics courses, so we're getting all the new hip stuff, maybe we are better at it. Or maybe it's that as I've gone on, I've gotten better at my skills, because I come to workshops like these, and um, the number of statistics courses doesn't really matter. So we're just kind of seeing if there's an interaction between um, sort of length outside of your PhD and the number of courses that you had. So thinking about what is mediation. So people draw this like model instead of the triangle. I don't know how helpful that is in understanding what mediation or moderation is. But if you see this picture, that's what they're implying. So if you have a triangle model with like an extra line, they're implying moderated mediation. And so what we're saying is if the number of courses is a moderator, the strength of the direction of the relationship between X, so years from PhD, and Y, regression skill, changes. So we're still talking about change, but now we're talking about levels of change. And so it's changing that relationship based on the level of the other one. Now that's really easy in ANOVA because levels are categorical. So, you know, the group difference for group, you know, level one is this, and the group difference level two is that. When you get into continuous variables, this gets a little bit more tricky. And so this, again, is from the Andy field. So it's the hours playing video games and aggression and how callous you are because these examples are great. So moderation really is about this fan. So if you have moderation, you'll see a fan effect. And so in this particular case, the red dots are the not callous people. And there's no relationship between hours playing video games and aggression and the green dots are the cows people, there is a relationship. That's still a categorical variable. So what do I do when they're all continuous? But uh, it's a nice picture to show you kind of how the, the correlations are different. Right. And so a moderation you can also think about is like testing if there's differences in correlations across the variable. Okay. And so here's another kind of way to think about it in 3D has that the, if there's no interaction, that's the one on the left, everybody has the same relationship. There is an interaction, the one on the right, some people's relationship is stronger and some people's relationship is weaker. So we get this fan picture. And I also make these hand signals at home when I make these videos. You just can't see them. My students can attest to this. <laughs> so it's, it creates this fan picture. Right? Um, but the way that it practically works, so you'll see the difference here is that people will draw this sort of picture, if they're, especially if they're creating a structural model for you or they're trying to show you what they think the relationship looks like, this is the picture for moderation. But practically, like math-wise, what happens is you get the predictor, your moderator, you can switch these. Okay, so it kind of just depends on which story you want to sell, okay, which one you pick as the predictor and the moderator, and their interaction. So now we've got three predictors. All right, so practical considerations for this, um, and this is where process is really handy. And in my R guide, if you're using R, I just talk about how to do this manually, but there's a really great package called QuantSci that'll also do this for you. 
So the interaction term is problematic. Right? So one of the issues with regression is multicollinearity, right? um, where you don't want variables that are too correlated in the same equation because you're losing power, and they're sort of um, killing each other out. And that's actually the purpose of mediation, <laughs> is testing that kind of how much are they suppressing each other. But in moderation, you're interested in both, and you think they're correlated because they're gonna, the levels matter. But when you put them both in the equation and their interaction term, now you're creating multicollinearity. So the simple solution for that is centering. There's a couple of types of centering. Most people just do mean centering. It depends on your research field, I feel like. Um, but I think mean centering is the easiest one. Where you take person X and you subtract the mean of variable X. So you're just subtracting the mean from everybody. So sort of half a z scores. And what that does, this is where my submarine starts to come in, right, is it really shifts everybody to the middle. Right? So we're talking about periscopes. Right? And it takes everybody and moves them to the zero. So now the mean of the variable is zero, and people who have uh, scores, like uh, positive scores, are higher than zero. People who have negative scores are lower than zero. This is kind of like z scoring. <coughs> You can actually z-score as well to solve multicollinearity, but then you have to think about the predictor as a beta. Um, and it's easier to interpret b. So most people stick with mean scoring because it just makes um, the interpretation of the predictors easier. Um, and that solves two problems, interpretation for uh, predicting inter looking at interaction terms and multicollinearity. Um, and so I just, one more slide, uh, the easiest way to do that is just to subtract the mean. Okay. And what that does is it moves everybody to where the middle of the distribution is zero. And zero in this case is a useful number. Right. Uh, and so the way that I interpret that, <clears throat> sorry, I, I got ahead of myself a minute ago, but uh, the way I interpret that is that people who are at zero are at my mean, and that creates an average. And so when you have two variables and they're both centered as zero, and you multiply them together, you get zero. So it allows us to see what's happening with the interaction by forcing some parts of the interaction to go away. Because when both variables are at average, the interaction is zero times zero. And that allows us to see what's happening with the variables when there's technically, mathematically, no interaction. Okay. So it gives me the average effect. So B now becomes what happens when both of these are average. And then we can use my summary example here in a second to figure out what happens when these variables are low, what happens when they're high. So let's say I get a significant interaction. And if the interaction is significant, kind of just like ANOVA, this is the way I teach it anyway, I would ignore the main effects. Because if I'm telling you that both variables are important, talking about each variable singularly may not be useful. And I'd want to follow up that interaction. Okay. Now this is called simple slopes. Okay, so you see people say, I did a simple slopes analysis. If you want a citation for simple slopes, uh, one of the best books for it is the Cohen, Cohen, Aiken, and West, or some combination of those four. Okay. It's a blue book about regression. And so generally, this is called simple slopes analysis. If you are using some of the newer terminology, ANOVA is often called simple effects. This is from the end, that's from the Andy field. So if these variables are dichotomous, and so in the new version of process, you can use all kinds of categorical variables, but if they're dichotomous, you're simply looking at one group's B value versus another group's B value, and that reduces sort of down to are the correlations different for each group? If both variables are totally dichotomous, it is ANOVA. But to understand what's happening, I still have to split somewhere. Okay. So you might, like let's say you're doing an ANOVA, and you have a two by two, you might look at the patterns um, across one of those variables. And so you kind of split them in half and run independent T or dependent T. <clears throat> We're only gonna cover the example of when they're doubly continuous because that's the hard one. But if you're interested in sort of half and half, one continuous, one categorical, or two categorical, I have examples on my website. <clears throat> And so how do I do these simple slopes? So think about which one you want to be, the, you want them to moderate. 
Because with moderation, you can use either X or M. You can switch them. And so which one do you want to know about low, average, high? Uh, so I did this where we looked at the level of statistics courses. So at different levels of statistics courses, we want to know what's the relationship between years and skills. So if I have n like a low number of courses or none, um, how do years of being out in the real world, being an academic, um, apply to regression skills? And then what if I've had a lot of courses? How does that apply? I could switch that though. I could say, um, what's the relationship between taking courses in my PhD to the levels of years outside? So I could say, if I'm fresh out of school, how, how much does the course impact my skills? And if I'm um, not fresh out of school, how much do those courses impact me? So I could easily switch those. Um, and for me, that's a, either a hypothesis question, you have a very specific set of order you want to look at, um, or just like, can you explain it kind of question. <clears throat> so thinking about theory in your field. So how are we going to create groups? This is the part where I usually lose people, so don't let me lose you. Um, we don't want to split the variable. So you're going to lose power if you create groups, real groups. So if you third split it, um, I've seen people do high and low where they take the bottom quartiles, but then you just totally, like there are people in the middle. <laughs> what about those? Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, look at low, and these are not groups, but we'll kind of treat it like that. And we'll look at people who are one standard deviation below the mean. So what's the correlation between, or the prediction, between number of years outside my PhD and regression skills if I have had a low number of classes? So one standard deviation below average. And then I, at average. And then what happens if I have had a lot of classes? So I would be in the high class group. How, how does that affect my relationship between years and skills? That's the most popular. So when people say simple slopes, they're usually describing plus minus one standard deviation. You could do actually anything. So you could do, um, the new version of process has like uh, kind of quantile, like it's like 16% average and 84%. So it's actually got the slopes even further on the ends of the distribution. Uh, we can also get in SPSS the johnson Neyman test, which gives us a big range of them. So I would tell you that the most popular thing is plus or minus one standard deviation, but that's not the only option. So what we're going to do is we're going to create, and I have this in quotes for a reason, low average and high groups. So we're going to treat this low group, this fake group, as people who are one standard deviation below that mean. The average is people who are at the mean, and the high group is people who are one standard deviation above the mean this is where it goes south. Okay, so creating these groups is not what you would think. You would think, okay, I'm just gonna, like for the low people, I'm gonna look at everything one standard deviation below, that's minus one standard deviation, end of story. Okay, that's not how it works. What happens, practically, is that our low group is created by adding a standard deviation to everybody. So back to periscopes. Okay. This is the only example, if you have a greater example, I'd love to give it to my students, <laughs> test it out on them. <laughs> And the like three or four that have already had this class are like, we, we'll see, right? So uh, we've moved everybody to the average, right? So we've talked about how I've taken everybody and subtracted the mean, and now the average is a zero. So I'm looking here, I can only look here. To be able to see the low group, right? There, like low for you guys would be over here. <laughs> right, so if I think about the low group, right? They're on the left side of the distribution. What do I have to do to get to the look at them here? I have to move them up. So if you think about uh, periscopes on a submarine, you can't move it. It's, it's like a bad video game. You have to take this part of the distribution and shift it to where you can see it. And so that low group is created by adding a standard deviation to everyone um, so that they are now in the middle. Okay. So if I'm at a lower number of courses, I have a negative score. So I move me up to zero so I can see it. Somewhere like this. So I always think about, like, how do I see them? Well, I move them up to the middle. Correspondingly, the high group is created by subtracting a standard deviation to bring them down to everybody else. 
this is a really funny story, which I don't have recorded, unfortunately. Was one time I was giving an example about people who had high and low status and how that affected some other variable. And I said, like, well, high people um, have no relationship because they don't care they're high. And I'm like, <laughs> the class at that point was done. <laughs> but that idea of like, how do I see these, this high group? In this case, it's a high number of courses. We'll have to bring them down to everybody else so that we can see them. So if you can think about how do I move them where I can see them and I can only see zero, that'll help you understand that low is created by moving up, a high is created by moving down. Periscope's the best example I've got for that. Yeah? Is this kind of related to what you did for centering? So you brought this right to zero, and then, so I'm thinking of the three-dimensional example you mm -hmm. had, where you're kind of like pulling the upper half of the fan to the middle, and then mm -hmm. pulling the lower half of the fan to the middle, and then you're gonna sandwich them on top of each other? Is that kind of what's happening, sort of? No sandwiching, but yes, up to the sandwich point. Yes. Um, so I, I have to, like, this is only so I can visualize it. Sure. The high group is still the people who are at the top of the distribution. But we're sort of talking about, like, what would happen if we only looked at the top of the distribution oh, yeah. without splitting anything. Sure. Right. <clears throat> because if we were to just simply create groups, we would lose power. There's lots of problems with splitting the data. <coughs> So if I were to run this in any processing software, um, what I would do is take my new low variable and my new high variable and I'd run this again. So I end up with three regressions. Um, and what I do with that is I look at the other variable. So we're splitting on the number of stats. So I'm gonna look at the PhD variable. Um, so whatever variable that you are moderating, so you're creating these low average and high groups, it does not change because the relationship between the moderator and X or Y is not changing. You're just moving people around. So when you add and subtract numbers to regression equations, they don't change the slope. So that's one of the nice things about, about this type of analysis. But it will change the other variable. Okay. So a hint, if the variable isn't changing, you're doing something wrong. Okay. Or it's not significant. Okay. So whatever variable we pick as M or the moderator, um, we're going to look at the other one. So for a long time, I used to call this the, the variable that you were um, flipping and the variable that you were wanting to look at. I don't know if that makes a whole lot of sense anymore, but it's the, the one that you are manipulating, low, average, and high, you look at the other one. Uh, to relate that to ANOVA, so let's say you had groups for men and women and you wanted to look at a relationship, so you split and did, here's men, here's women's. You're actually looking at the relationship of the other variable for men. So what we're doing here is looking at the relationship for PhD to skills for low stats, then average stats, and then high stats. And then uh, making a picture of this, you're gonna get some, if it's significant, you're gonna get a fan. Okay, it might be a tiny fan, but um, you will see those slopes changing. If it's not significant, you get parallel lines or lines that are all on top of each other. So it might be that one variable matters, but the slopes are all the same strength. And really nice interactions that are the easiest to explain switch directions. Um, or they just simply get stronger or weaker. All right, so let's try an example of that one now. So back to power. So power for moderation is um, a little more straightforward. We're gonna use the exact same test, but the number of predictors is now three. Okay. So we're gonna use the same effect size, the same kind of test in G power, if we're gonna use G power, but you have three predictors. And that stumps people because I have the X and I have my moderator, that's only two, but you have to remember that that interaction term gets added to the equation and counts against you as a predictor. So you're actually testing three predictors. Okay. Everything else is pretty, pretty similar. So alpha, I picked 0.05. Power um, is 0.8, not beta. Okay. So the number of predictors is what we're going to change to three. So I did this example at a larger effect size, so 0.14 for R squared. And I'd only need 72 people to see this interaction if it's there and at that size. Okay. Um, 
one thing, let's say you're going to do uh, three-way interactions, uh, you would have to think about like, okay, I've got one, two, three variables, but how many interaction terms does that create? Well, it creates one by two, one by three, and two by three, and one, two, three, so it creates a lot more of them. So the more uh, moderators that you add, the, the bigger the number of predictors get. And so when you can't, you can't quite figure out, I'll just tell you to run the analysis and see how many there are, and then use that for power. So our example is going to be how many years since PhD, how many classes did I take, and then some we've like measured their score. We've given them a test and measured their score to so see how good they are at regression. All right, and then this whole this part right here just explains centering a little bit more and it explains how you would screen the data. So I'm going to kind of skip all that. Get to the good part. This is good fake data, so, all right. <coughs> so now I'm on page 26 of the SPSS guides. We're gonna use that same procedure, analyze regression process. And this, if you're using the old version, it goes into the mediator box. If you're using the new version, this is where it's changed a little bit because I did it wrong a couple times before I figured it out. Um, it goes into the moderator variable box. So I think it fixed some confusion that people had where uh, this mediator box here was always M, mediator, moderator, it didn't matter. And now they've sort of split it and made it clear that this box is only for mediation and this one's for moderation. <clears throat> Covariates here is, uh, I didn't cover this a second ago, but it's where you could add other variables you were interested in controlling for maybe. So I've got my regression skills as my DV, my years since PhD is my X. I stuck stats into W there, down there. I could switch these. Uh, the big thing here is to change this to model number one. I'm fairly sure that when you open process, it's automatically at model number four, because mediation is, um, I think, more popular for the plugin. So you have to change this to one. If you run this with four, it will tell you, you stuck a moderator in the mediator box, and vice versa. All right, I'm going to hit options. The options here are a little different. So I can create, uh, generate code for visualizing interactions. And these are the ugliest graphs I've seen in a long time. But it will give you the numbers you need if you want to use Excel instead. Um, mean center for construction of products, which will give us the, the mean option. Uh, it'll allow you to like not show the interaction if it's not significant, which I think is kind of nice because it used to always show you. So we get tons of questions. Well, my interaction is significant, but it showed me these other things. And I'm like, well, but your interaction is insignificant. Um, so this drop down under probe interactions actually has, I think, 10, 5, 01, and 001. Conditioning values is the simple slopes box. So it'll allow you to do the ends of the distribution or plus and minus one standard deviation. So that's when I picked. Uh, sorry, our folks, but this Johnson Neyman is only an SPSS. There's probably a way to do an R, I just haven't found it yet. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that when we look at the output. Questions so far? Yeah. I didn't change it. That's the default. Um, we could change it. And the only thing it would do is if it weren't, if P weren't less than alpha, it's really asking you what you want alpha to be here, um, then it would just show you nothing at the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Can you use number of courses as a mediation variable instead of a moder moderation variable? How do you think that would change your question? Yeah, so I would say that as I would think, like hypothetically, in a perfect world, is like as courses went up, it doesn't really matter the number of years that you are outside your. It's more about the courses that you've taken. Um, where in this case, it's about courses and time outside. So I would think like after I get out of school, I, there's two, sort of two ways. I have all these demands and I don't have time for this, and I've, it's been a long time since I've thought about it. Or I'm trying to get tenure. So I gotta be able to do this really well, so maybe I'm getting better because I'm practicing. 
So mediation, uh, mediation really forces, forces me to say, well, the relationship between school time and skills goes away. Whereas moderation has allowed me to say, maybe those two things interact in such a way that when both of them are low, I get one relationship, but when one's low and one's high, I get a different relationship. That makes sense? So mediation to me is a little more limiting, like it's only going away. Well, moderation is like, something is changing based on one of them. <clears throat> All right. <coughs> Others? All right. So the output for this is much shorter because there's no stages. So I would report this model summary, and so you can tell it's made up data because that's a huge R squared, right? But my overall model with all three predictors, so my years since PhD, my number of staff classes, and INT1 in this output is the interaction, um, is significant. So I'm predicting a significant amount of the variance in regression skills based on both variables. So 40% of the variance. If I look at years since PhD all by itself, um, that is also significant. So people who are outside of school longer have more uh, regression skills. So for every one year, I get 1.8 points of regression skills. But the number of classes is also really important. So for every class that they have, they get four more approximately regression points here on our coefficient. And that's just like the basic regression interpretation, right? So for every year outside your PhD and every class you had, you're getting more towards your skills. But the interaction is also significant. So it's not just about one or the other, it's about both at the same time. But I can't really interpret 0.8. Like, that's really hard, like I don't know what that number means. So to break apart that, we're going to do the simple slopes. <clears throat> And so um, <coughs> this little section, this test of higher order unconditional interactions is new. So it's newer in this version of the process. And it essentially tells you what would happen if you ran the model as just X and W as main effects of no interaction, and then you ran a second model and added the interaction. So this is very similar to SPSS's hierarchical window where it shows you like step one and step two. This shows you what would happen if you added the interaction in a second step um, as opposed to just the two main effects. So what it does is it gives you a effect size for the interaction, which is really nice. Okay. So 8% of that variance of the 40 is due to the interaction. Um, now, the F-test numbers here, that's going to match the T value. So I would just report T, but that r square change is really handy. Ah, stop. There it goes. And then I've just got kind of that interpretation we just went through here. So I'd say the overall model is significant, my interaction added 8%, and then I just kind of talked about each B at one at a time. I'm getting my T value degrees of freedom from that second degree of freedom overall model. So, so are those D values already standardized? Like, coefficient values, are they already standardized in the values center? Or no, because they're still in this wheel of the data, they're just Perfect. The second half. So by choosing this mean center option, it's going to move everything where the average is zero, but it's not dividing by the standard deviation. So these okay. are not beta. Okay. They're just B. And so the reason people like because I feel like it used to be even. I was actually taught to do z-score standardization, um, but I think mean centering is more popu popular now because that I can interpret as every one year of my PhD I get 1.8 points because it's still in the same scale of the data. Okay. Instead of being for every one standard deviation of PhDs, I get one, this standard deviation of points, which is harder to interpret. Okay. If you wanted to compare them to each other and talk about which one's the strongest predictor, that's where beta would come in. Yeah. <coughs> Other people? Am I doing all the time? Okay, good. All right, let's look at these simple slips. So this little section here is just a reminder of this like kind of periscope idea. So when you're looking at these later and you're like, what was that thing that she said? Um, I've stuck it in here. 
And then this section here is where uh, the interaction, the first part of the interaction is shown. So it tells you focal predict, that's which one is X, uh, moderator variables, number of stats. Okay. And so I think the interpretation of this part's the, probably the trickiest. So when I look here, it tells me the number of stats. So this is kind of like a group for, for my stats variable. So the negative 1.46 is the low group. Practically, to get that number, I had to add a standard deviation. We talked about how this is backwards, but this is the low groups variable. Okay. So these are people who are one standard deviation below the mean, and one standard deviation in this data set is about one and a half classes. Um, so even though mathematically I had to add and subtract in a backwards way, the interpretation here is that one's the low group. Okay. Uh, the effect is B. So I wish it was still called coefficient, because that's what it is. Okay. And then all the rest of these columns are the same, standard errors T. So for the low group, um, every year outside the PhD adds half of a regression skill. Okay. For the average group, every year outside the PhD, that's the same as your main effect for B, um, adds 1.8 points of skills. And then if you have a lot of classes, um, so the high group, so if I've had a, a class and a half more than normal, okay, I'm getting three points of skills every year outside my PhD. <clears throat> so that is where the fan idea comes in. So if you only have your kind of standard two classes, right, you're like standard ANOVA and research methods or ANOVA and regression was ours, outside of the PhD, that's not significant. So you're getting like a half a regression skill because you have a a student that needs help or you got to publish this article. Okay. But if you have more, if you have the average number of classes, so let's say three or four, uh, every year outside of your PhD you're getting one, almost two points of skills. And that one is significant. And then let's say you have a lot of classes because uh, you're going to school with a strong quant program or you're in a quant program, you're getting three points of skills. Now, the significance of these individually, it may or may not be significant. They may all be significant, or they actually may all not be significant. I feel like that's the harder one to explain. So the, the moderation tells you if B is different. It doesn't tell you about the significance of these Bs. It just tells me that these B values are different. They're usually, they're usually significant, but in this case, one of them isn't, two of them are. That's not so important as at the low level, it's pretty flat. But the more classes you have, the more your skills kind of gain outside of school. So I think interpreting these, remember that this no stats part is which group it is, and then this B value is X to Y. All right, and then it kind of explains all that in here. <clears throat> Let me show you the Johnson name in. So the way Johnson Amen works is it finds 0.05. So it finds that like magic spot, right? Which at this case is negative 0.45. So you can see it kind of here-ish in the middle. So it finds 0.05 and then it slowly works its way up and down. And sometimes these are called zones of significance. I think that's kind of why it's losing flavor is because of the, the zones of significance name. But I think this is a really interesting test because it allows me to find the areas in which the X and Y are not related and X and Y are related as part of that moderation. So at a half a point or half a class below average, so let's say average is four classes for a PhD. Okay. So this would be three classes or less practically. Okay. Um, the relationship between years and regression skills is nil. Okay. So there's just pretty much nothing there. And it actually flips to negative. So you're like forgetting things and you're like just kind of like, I don't know what's going on, right? Um, at, um, past that point though, so kind of on average number of classes and up, we're getting um, more and more skills as we go. So it allows you to kind of see how that fan effect is happening and pinpoint the place at which below this, none of it matters. And above this, this is where it's significant. Uh, if the variables are really related, the Johnson name it may say like everything's significant, oh well. Um, but if it has a point in which one is 
not significant one is, this is really nice because it pinpoints that spot for you, the sweet spot. Um, and for me, it really allows me to look at like, what would the slopes be at every kind of different level? You don't really get a choice on the levels here. That's part of the thing, it finds P105 for you, but um, I can tell that like it's increasing about 0.2 points with, um, with the number of stats classes. Yeah. Is this the point where moderation becomes dependent on continuous data in order to show this? Because you could definitely not do this with, I don't even know if you could do this with like anything above, uh, anything less than continuous data. Right, and really this would be better if the data were, if I assumed that the underlying variable were truly continuous. Like number of stats classes is not truly continuous. Right. It's kind of like I took a course, I took a course. But if you have some sort of latent trade or IQ or something that you believe is really a continuous distribution, this is very, very nice. Because you can look at the, the, the way the fan works, if it's significant. I think if it's not significant, it doesn't show you anything. Okay. Um, I haven't figured out how to do that in R yet. I'm sure there's a way. There's always a way. Right. So I haven't yet. So I've got that interpretation kind of how this analysis works. And I wouldn't say that that's a standard thing to do, but I think it's really kind of helps people understand their data a little better. And on that point, let's talk about this nonsense. <laughs> so the nice thing is that it provides you with code. This is sim straight syntax to create the pictures. The bad thing is, is that SPSS's graphing options have not changed since I was in graduate school, really. Um, and they're still hideous. But the good thing is that I can actually use this set of data to create maybe an Excel box and create it in Excel. Um, I don't have any instructions on how to do that, but if that's something you're interested in doing, that would be easy for me to kind of show you how to do or create a little video for and send you a link to. Okay. Um, but if you cut and paste this from the output, and put it in a syntax window, it will make you an ugly plot. And I have exactly how to do that. If you've never done syntax before, and syntax is kind of frightening, I have like how you would do that. Um, and this is the plot it makes. And so the hard part about this is that like, I, I tried to actually sh like clean it up and show you how you clean it up, but it's just so difficult to work with on like where do I put the variable names and stuff. Um, I just went ahead and made it in Excel. What's happening is I have my year since my PhD, which to create this plot, I really made as low and high because you have to sort of categorize to just make the lines happen. And then this is that fan. So a low number of courses, there's really no relationship between their years outside of school and my skills. But as I get more and more courses, my skills continue to grow as I grow in I, you know, academia or wherever you end up. So that's that fan effect. It's the same picture as a couple pages before, um, but as part of SPSS, it's, it's chopped off the bottom. So it's created like a bigger kind of fan and I didn't chop off the bottom of mine. The other thing I've put on um, OSF for you is this Excel guide, which I do not remember where I found, but I found on the internet. <clears throat> that will make simple pictures for you. And you can kind of clean up in whatever way you like Excel. Make this much, much bigger, there we go. And so you, you can do is use that, those set of numbers that you get from, as part of the process output and plug and chug them in. So I'm talking about it creates that graph from these numbers here I just kind of have to map. So what I would do, I don't have a screenshot of this in the guide, but what it's done for me as part of the out, as part of the syntax part here is it's got, this is low, low. So low PhD, low stats. This is average PhD, low stats. So it's created like a little low average high by low average high. And so you just have to kind of map them together. So at low, low, I'm at, 55, so at low, low, I filled in 55. So you can kind of fill it in, especially if you don't like Excel either. Um, 
and it'll create these kind of nice fan pictures for you. Now, there are no confidence intervals on these um, because we're just creating those points. You can actually calculate the confidence intervals for these points as well and add them. It's just not part of the output, standard output. I think somewhere over here it says where I stole this from. Oh, yes. So that if you wanted to cite the people who actually made this, I did not make this. All right. That aside, uh, I always recommend making, like the picture's worth a thousand words in this case. Like I could tell you that the slope is 0.48, but this really sells, that sells the story, right? So at increasing levels of courses, um, the relationship between PhD and uh, skills is also increasing. Um, and so another example that we've uh, submitted is we were looking at uh, body checking skills. I'm not a clinician, I'm just a clinician's friend sometimes. Um, and so across days, right, we had uh, decreasing levels of body checking. So across days, the slope of checking across days got well, flatter and flatter. So we made this kind of picture of like days by checking across the day, and it just got flatter and flatter. So we, as we um, made them notice more in the experiment, they stopped doing it as much. So it's kind of like when you tell somebody they're doing something obnoxious over and over and over again, <laughs> they stopped doing it as much. So we were, that picture really sold our story. Like on day one, they were, they were decreasing a lot because we were like, hey, don't do this, hey, don't do this. But on day five, that message had gotten through, so they weren't really changing much anymore. And so the, to me, the pictures are where it's at. But I also got an example of how you report this. And they're really short because you're just uh, essentially talking about three different B values, what you're interested in. All right, so questions on moderation. Uh, Eugene, first on the game. Well, this, this is over time. FDSS will um, do standard variables and it will create the low and high version of the moderator. Yep, that is. Oh my gosh, eight scrollings later. But that's in the options window. It's that mean center box check. Okay. Right here. So that. And it creates the interaction term for you and everything. So you don't even have to do it. Um, if you wanted to do that in R, I think it's quant sci that does. We'll do the same thing. Your question. I'm curious as to why you got interested in this question of uh, years out of PhD and number of courses. Uh, well, I was trying to come up with a different example that was sort of about stats to make a joke. <laughs> um, I really don't think that's probably the relationship. It's probably more about like what types of questions you were research field uses, because that's usually where I get asked to help, is like, oh, well, we almost always do ANOVAs, but they told us we had to do it this way, and we found you on YouTube. <laughs> so um, I am not, I like, there's only so many uh, data sets I have that work, and so I took one of my old ones and just made this a different example. Yeah. Right, so moderation is an MLR, yeah. right? And so I'm just adding the interaction. So normally we would just do the two main effects, mm -hmm. right? And what happens when controlling for one, what happens with the other? But in this case, I think that they interact and they create this fan, so I'm also adding the interaction. Okay. Does that answer your question? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, where I pulled the numbers from, this part? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So this one here is, it's like low, average, high. So anytime you see zero, that means it's the average because we centered it. So low, average, high. And these low, average, high. So this is low, low. So I got 54, 66. So I came over here and filled that in at low, low. Okay. So then now I need to find average courses and low PhD. Sounds weird to say, right? So here's average courses and low PhD. So it's the first line, it's 55, 37. Um, I, since you can do this in SPSS and make it kind of easily, I tell you to make it and see what it should look like and then make it in Excel and make sure it still matches. Right. And then here I had to do high, low. 
So I did the high stats, low PhD is 56. I'm just kind of fill them in. Yeah. Kind of tagging off of the top of this question. So the, this is an MLR, but the moment it differs from your standard MLR is when you start controlling for multicollinearity of the interaction by centering, right? That's like the minute it kind of departs. Because you're kind of, isn't it that you're just kind of preparing for that interaction? Yeah, I mean, the centering is a practical issue, right? Because otherwise, um, especially if you're using uh, R, it will sometimes be, it'll tell you that it's unstable, yeah. right? Um, so centering really allows me to interpret better and it solves for multicollinearity. Uh, it's still multiple regression, yeah. just with a fancy name. Other questions? Um, so just in kind of a sum, you can always contact our lab and ask for help. And like I said, unless it's the very beginning of a semester and then usually it's just beginning of semester not nonsense. But um, I do have like all of my contact information on these. I have way more videos. I do also take requests for ideas. Um, so I've got, if you like kind of wanting to mix the two together and do moderated mediation, I've got some examples of that in both programs. I've also got three-way interactions. I don't recommend anything higher than a three-way interaction because you might be unhappy with yourself. Um, I have a student here, Nick, in the front can tell you about that. Um, but I have an example of how to work one of those as well. 